And we would like to do it, so our goal was to do it more efficiently than prior work. And I'll say a few words about prior work. And also, we didn't set, set out you know, to, to protect against malicious adversaries. So this is at least starting out in a, this very comfortable, cozy, honest, but curious model. And then uh, take some steps to optimize for pre-computation if you're running repeated. Of course, some sometimes in certain settings, protocols are only run once or, or once run very infrequently. So it makes sense to have protocols that are, are efficient alone in isolation. And it also makes sense to have protocols that are efficient in the sort of repeated, repeated re re settings where, where you can pre-compute because you know you're going to r run the protocol over and over. And then we'll, I'll say a few words about an implementation. So we actually built the prototype uh, using some of, the, some of the protocols that I'll show you. OK, so prior work largely falls into either polynomial, or sort of oblivious polynomial evaluation, where really this topic started with, with uh, Friedman, Naor, and Pinkas in 2004 and then was followed up by Kistner and Song at Crypto05. And then I, I think I'm missing probably a couple of other results that fall into this general category of uh, uh, taking advantage of polynomials. Right? I think the latest one was the Columbia team with uh, Dachman, Malkin, Reichel, and Jung at CCNS. But I think they even, even they have a follow-on with, with, with polynomial. Um, and they have something on multi, multi or group set intersection based on, on polynomials. Now, so what, what about polynomials? Well, on, on the good side, it's a very elegant technique, right? It's a very cute and sort of easy to comprehend what is, what, is, what, what is there. And it's also fairly easy to build other auxiliary protocols. Now, I'll say a few words later about auxiliary protocols. But the, 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 the drawback is that they, they don't lend themselves somehow to efficient constructions. So polynomial with Linear complexity is somehow not exactly there. And then the other family is OPRF, or Oblivious to Random Functional Evaluation Protocols. And uh, I think the first one was Hase and Lindell. And then Li I think Lindell had some follow-ons, but there was a version of TCC08. And then TCC09 had Yaretsky and Liu that had another OPRF construction. And these protocols, I don't remember my Hase Lindell. I think it was, it was all linear. I think these protocols are fully linear. Definitely, Yaleski and Lee was fully linear. And uh, linear, I mean bandwidth and linear computation, which is a, a huge step forward. But not exactly the end. Why not the end? Because, well, never, never be an end, the end, but it's, it's still an intermediate step because these, the primitives used in both Hase and Lindell and Yaleski Liu are fairly heavyweight. Okay, so when they talk about linear, they talk about exponentiations that, you know, with, that cost 20, 20, 30 times the, 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 um, the price of standard exponentiations. As far as authorized PSI protocols, well, there are some relatives. They're not exactly the same thing, but very close. So PPIT, you already saw, PPIT is, is kind of like an authorized private set intersection where the client's input are authorized. But you saw already that it's a little bit inefficient. Right? And the best we could do naively is to have a quadratic multiplication cost. But what I didn't tell you is that you still had to have unpleasant bandwidth. But okay. And then there's something called public key encryption with keyword search. And then uh, there are several results. One of them is uh, by Kamenish and others at PKC09. Well, those are quadratic. Okay? So that was the kind of the common wisdom in the community is that, oh, if you're going to do this kind of authorized keyword search, you're going to have to have quadratic overhead. And the same is true for. Uh, Another uh, result by, on, on certified sets. So certified sets basically is that both parties have certified sets. And essentially, they don't call it private set intersection, but essentially that's exactly what they're trying to do in, in, in this work by Kamenish and Zaverucha at FC09. And is again quadratic cost. 
Okay, but notice certified sets. That means both parties have authorized inputs. Okay, so that's a little bit, little bit ni nicer, uh, different. So our goal is efficient linear complexity PSI using standard crypto. Yes, standard is the second most abused word in cryptography. So practical and it's standard. Look at me, I'm using standard. They're using like a weird exotic assumption. I'm using standard. I fit in a box. All right, so let's recall the setting. We have client and server in, in, in a private set intersection uh, world. And then if you have authorized private set intersection, then we have a, a CA or some kind of third party. Uh, <clears throat> at the end, I might say something about this. If I don't, maybe somebody wants to remind me about the CA issue because it kind of simplifies things a little bit. As far as algorithms, uh, well, we got to have a setup algorithm, the selection of global parameters, like in most protocols. In, in case of authorization, uh, APSI, we have to have an authorized protocol between the client and the CA. Now, if the server's inputs are authorized, clearly there has to be a, another protocol between the server. But let's just concentrate on client's inputs optionally being authorized. So client commits to inputs, CA issues authorizations. Input being set elements. Yeah? And the client doesn't have to obtain set element authorizations all at the same time. He can sort of get them incrementally. And then the main, the main part is the interaction, right? This is the actual protocol whereby the set intersection is being uh, computed. And, and then at the end, the client gets it, uh, the intersection. Obviously, well, wait, wait a second, this is one way, right? So let's concentrate on one way, because if we know how to do it one way, then we can just well, not just, it's not exactly trivial, but it's not difficult to put together two one-way set intersection protocols and obtain a mutual set intersection. Modular some minor fairness issues, but we're not talking about fairness here, so. Um, the informal requirements would be, well, correctness, because a client must always open the uh, output the intersection if, if it exists. A client will only output the intersection if each element in it has been authorized. That's for the authorized version, right? To see the difference between the correctness, right? For one is for PSI, the other one is APSI. Server privacy, the client learns nothing about the server's elements that are not in the, in the intersection. And for APSI, the client learns nothing about server's elements not in the intersection and, and not, or not authorized. So, right, it must be in intersection and be authorized for him to learn anything. The server must learn nothing about the client set, but keep in mind that remark I made about the size. The size of the set, you might plan. And then on linkability, the client cannot tell if any two protocol instances are related. So it's a standard distinguishability, right, game. Should not be able to tell. Right? Okay, so now we're gonna try to get APSI from PPIT. Now you say, wait a second, we, weren't, we already were there about 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. We tried to do that and it was not efficient. So we're gonna take another look how to do it a little bit less naively. That is, use this knowledge we have from kind of how, how to transmit, like in this case, RSA signatures, so like kind of blind RSA signatures and transmit them to the server in order to, to extract information. So we call in PPIT, the client retrieves sensitive information from the server and only gets information from which it is authorized. So the server learns nothing. So we notice that PPIT can in fact imply APSI. Now here, so you might say this is not exactly what we looked at, right? So PPIT doesn't exactly do that, does it? But more or less, more or less, let's just go with the flow and say this is, does it, but with quadratic complexity. quadratic in terms of multiplications, which is still not negligible. It's not clear how to take this, even if it wasn't quadratic, and move it to private set intersection without authorization. So usually you think, oh, removing a feature is easy. But it's not exactly trivial. How do you remove the authorization part? Well, what happens? So that's what we're going to look. Maybe we can do it by self-signing, right? So for example, if we say, oh, there's not really, a, not really a CA out there, but client instead commits to its inputs by signing them, by acting as a CA. That's a potential direction. But I'm not going to go there exactly there right now. Instead, 
I'm going to show you a protocol. This is going to say the protocol that actually achieves linear complexity, and also sort of related related to PPIT that we saw before. So this is going to be a little more involved. So bear with me. So we're going to assume now that the server and the client each have a set of elements, W elements on the server, V elements on, on, on the client. Um, we can assume that, in fact, the elements are arbitrarily long, but we're going to hash them down to standard length. Okay, so in fact, what we're really comparing is the hashes of those elements um, over here, right? So the server has computes hashes of all of its elements, and we kind of call them HSJ, and the client computes hashes of all of its elements, we're going to call it HCI. So this is really the elements we're going to compare. And then, of course, the client has a signature, right, on each element of its set, because we're talking about authorized private set intersection. So it's still going to be an RSA signature. Why RSA? Why not Schnorr? Well, because Schnorr has these other problems that we talked about. Right? It, it's not, it, it doesn't give us a linkability or forward security. So, and we also don't know how to do it efficiently. Okay? That's our main reason. So, okay, sorry, this, these little squares are actually m multiplication. So I don't know why they show up like that, but on my Mac they look like multiplication. Sides. Huh? Oh, it is printed. Okay, so because it's PDF. It was PDF generated on the Mac. Yeah, so this PCH is not Pacific Coast Highway, but a product of client hashes. So the, cli the client is going to multiply all of its hashes. It's all mod all, everything is mod n. Wait a second. Who's mod n? Well, in this case, it's APSI, so it's going to be the CA's mod n. CA is the only one who has the RSA setting here. So the client is going to multiply the hashes, and then for every, uh, and it's going to multiply also the signatures. So remember, the hashes and the signatures are related, right? So these are the hashes for the messages on which it has the signature. So we have PCH, PCH star. And then it's going to create this uh, other weird little values. Basically, PCH star i is PCH star missing one of the hashes. Okay, so it's all but one. Okay, so it's going to be i of those. Then it's going to generate a few random numbers, like one for each value i, and then um, uh, one general random number. And it's going to create this x. All right, so this is similar to PPIT you saw before. This is very similar. Okay, then it's also going to blind these PCH star i's. You see the PCH star i's here? You're going to blind each one of them separately with a distinct random value. And these two things are going to flow to the server. Okay, so this is bandwidth V, you know, linear bandwidth, clearly. And then the server is going to do something very similar to what you saw in PPIT. Computer Diffie-Hellman half key. And then, here's the crucial step. It computes a key key as K as J. It's, what the server does here, it, it sort of, to give you some intuition, it takes every element in its set, which is these SHS, and it divides X to the E. See, this is the X. And X is like an accumulator. Right? It multiplies all the, all the client hashes. And it divides X to the E by HSJ. What does that do? If HSJ is not an element that is present in the client set, nothing interesting happens. Okay? Nothing interesting happens. But if HSJ is equal to one of the HCIs, they're going to cancel out. OK? And what's going to be left here, remember, we raise x to the e. So in fact, this PCH star becomes PCH. OK? What's going to happen here is PCH star i is going to be left here. More or less. Not exactly. It's going to be actually PCH star, star i to the e. Okay? And so, so this only works if, I mean, this will work out the way we want it if HSJ is the same as one of the HCIs. Okay? This is a tag. This computation is a tag. We don't, strictly speaking, need it. But if we weren't, if we didn't have it, then there would be a lot of trial decryptions necessary. Okay, so this is for convenience. Okay, and this, you can think of this as OP, an OPRF. 
kind of an oblivious BRF. So these three values, there's v of these and there's V of these are going to be sent back. And this is a constant, I'm sorry, a constant length value. So this is again, remember, Diffie-Hellman half key. So here's what's going to happen. Whoops. For every value that it has, okay, for every, for every value that the client has, he's going to compute this. He's going to take each one of those y's, y star. Remember, each y here corresponds to a y, y prime here. So you're going to take this y prime, multiply it to z to the rc. Z is the, the Diffie-Hellman half key coming from here. rc is the random number generated over there. Remember, you also used here. And z to the minus rci. Why does that work? Oops, sorry. Well, I don't have a correctness equation, but you can work it out quickly and see on paper and see that it actually matches out. And the client will only get the client will only get the intersection and nothing else. That is, he will be able to extract only this, that he gets CI or HCI in, in the intersection of the two sets if the tag T prime I is an intersection of these two sets, the set of T primes and the set of T's. Remind you what these are. Here's the T's, here are T primes. So he's just matching tags. Ah. So the intersection of the two sets of tags. Right, remember this is the, 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 so this this uh, this tag here. Let's look at how it's computed. It's a, it's basically a hash of a key, right? Uh, of, of of one of those keys. And look what the client does here. He does he recomputes the same kind of key. He hashes it, gets his own tag. Now the claim is that KCI is the same as KSJ only if corresponding set elements match. And only if the corresponding set elements match. Now the claim is, and this, this paper appeared at FC Financial Crypto 2010, and uh, the proofs, uh, I refer you to, to the, to the, actually there's an ePrint version, I refer you to that for proofs. Uh, the proofs are, again, in this very cozy, comfortable, honest, but curious uh, model. And, um, Of course, random oracles are necessary as well, which may not be to some everyone's liking, but uh, we like them. We need the hashes anyway. We need the hashes here, so we might as well use a random oracle. So this is the very first and maybe the only authorized private set, private set intersection protocol with linear, fully linear complexity, bandwidth and computation on both sides. Now, we ask the question, wait a second. so looking at this protocol, can we deconstruct it? Can we remove this authorization feature so that it becomes a private set intersection protocol and maybe in the process, you know, cut down the, co the cost a little bit? Well, you can, in fact, do that, and we did. And then we realized that once you deconstruct it, you take away the authorization part, you no longer need the RSA setting. Because the RSA setting here comes from CA. Right? So we, it comes, the original need for the RSA setting comes from the, from the CA. So what we could do, in fact, convert it to a much more comfortable, or no, not much, slightly more comfortable mod P setting and try to see what happens. And again, we have the server and the notation is similar, except the protocol looks cleaner and simpler because we don't have the authorization step anymore. So we have the same PCH and PCH, PCHI, but we don't longer have PCH star because we don't have signatures. So now remember, this is no, just a regular private set intersection protocol. There's no authorization required. We assume that inputs on both sides are good. Okay, we trust in the goodness of the, of the inputs. So we still have the same values, you see this PC, uh, X and YIs, and the same, same values get sent. 
And very similar math happens here. The same kind of key gets computed. Except that here, we no longer exponentiate with E because we no longer have this implicit verification of signatures. So indeed, the messages look very, very similar. And the whole thing works in mod P. Same way. Maybe this one looks clearer than the previous particle. And this is one more, it's, it, the, the, the security proof is based on one more DH. Now, if somebody remembers I said standard. Well, is it standard? Maybe Horav will comment on standardiosity of that assumption. Okay, okay. well then. We're all in the same, you see, you see cahoots, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, so, so the previous one is based on, on one more RSA. This one is based on one more DH. And the same claim that the client gets the intersection, which is the intersection, I mean, elements in, uh, in both sets of tags. Uh, turns out one can do some pre-computation, actually cut down the cost a little bit further. Like if you look at the computation of the, on the server side, he computes this value for the key. This is the heaviest computation. Um, well, because you see HS, HSJ to the RS is something that can be pre-computed and stored. Right? So the only thing in real time you'd have to do is compute X to the RS. That's just one exponentiation. And then multiply. So instead of having um, V plus W exponentiations, you reduce, we reduce the cost to order V exponentiations, but also V plus W multiplications. Okay, so no longer, nothing is quadratic any longer. And there's absolutely nothing quadratic here. Everything is linear. But we're just reducing the linear bits and pieces. So we still have W multiplications. Eh? On the client side, we can also pre-compute, but client pre-computation is like, not really, not really interesting, right? Because the client is the initiator in the protocol, so the computation is a given. So let's see if we can take it just a tiny, tiny bit further and say, well, oh, oh, what's, what does server do? The server performs as many computations in this protocol as there are records in this database, right? And if you can imagine the, the, the more sort of familiar client-server setting, client has a small set and a server has a large set because a database could be very large, right? So it seems kind of unfair for the client to kind of invoke the server and force it to do order W operations. Right? Especially for a large database, that's just not, not nice. So at the same time, you can, you can claim that order V client exponentiations could be a burden as well, especially for a small client. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a less less of a motivating uh, factor, but still, you know, if we have a PDA, maybe uh, doing o o order V uh, exponentiation is a burden. But mainly this is an issue. So let's see if we can do better. There is a, a slightly different uh, protocol. It's not, it's not, it, it, it's, it's sort of still based on our, this kind of our distant RSA uh, setting, but, 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 but it comes from a slightly different source. Here's how it works. So again, we have the same notation. Except that now um, the server is going to pre-compute pre some things. And in particular, he's going to pre-compute uh, these tags. So, so it's a slightly different setting because remember before, the tags that the server would compute dependent on client's input. In this setting, in this protocol, the server's tags are not going to depend on client input. That is, the server is going to pre-compute them and publish them. So this is, this is back to RSA world, except now the RSA is on the server side. Remember, there's no CA anymore. The RSA is on the server side. The server will basically compute values like this. He's going to take every one of its elements and he's going to basically sign it. Okay? And he's going to, from each signature, he's going to compute a tag and he's going to publish all those tags. Okay? So in real time, the client will do something similar to what you've seen before. The client is going to compose, compose values like this, right? He's going to take every element and he's going to blind it. And what is it? Well, without me showing you the next step, you know what's coming. 
blind RSA. That's what's coming. So he's going to use the server as a blind RSA signer. Server's going to sign every value here, return the result. The client will unblind it, right? Textbook, blind RSA, and compute tags. And then it's going to compare these tags to those published. And I should say, this is very, very similar uh, to a recent, uh, but for some strange reason, still unpublished work by Stasia Vesky and, and, and one of his students, uh, Xiaomin Liu, based on sort of very similar techniques like that, but he uses a blind DH kind of approach, blind, blind, blind Diffie Hellman, to do the same thing. And it costs a similar, I would say it's slightly more efficient because there, some, of this, some of this stuff can be done like this. This CRT can be used and uh, here, uh, this E is, well, basically multiplica uh, two multiplications. So uh, this is a cheaper protocol, but it's very similar by this to this technique. And I think this also, this, this protocol itself is also uh, based on, I think Fujisaki or Komoto, something like that. There is a, there is a previous result that, that shows some, a, 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 very, a, a very similar technique, but not in the context of private set intersection. Okay. So when, this is not a, you know, an invention of this protocol. Okay, just an application of some previously known technique to private set intersection. So this protocol is very nice because you see the bandwidth is well seemingly minimal, right? You have v values coming this way and v values coming back. There is no w. There's nothing that size w, right? Whatever is of size w is published be beforehand. So it seems like a nice protocol. Here's one problem. This protocol cannot be converted into authorized version. So you cannot, at least, we, we don't know how, okay. I say cannot. We don't know how to convert it to authorized version. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's linkable because you see the server has to commit to this and publish it. So if the server's database changes, he has to republish. And all fluctuations in, database, in the database are visible to the client. So you, there, there's a bit of uh, secu uh, privacy that gets sacrificed here. Okay. Okay. All of the protocols that you've seen, adding data transfer is trivial, right? Because remember, the data transfer part is important for practical applications, uh, where the server has a record with revealed data accompanying each item. So, bah, all we do is uh, just introduce another key. Remember, in, each, in all the protocols you've seen, there is some, some kind of a master key for every, for every record or for every tag. So we just introduce another hash function and compute a different key, which then we, we then use to encrypt data. And no, no big deal. And uh, well, other than, of course, the appropriate bandwidth expansion, no real complexity effect is felt. Any questions so far? OK, so this is some bird's eye view comparison with some other results. So I think this is the Kamenish Saberusha. This is also Kamenish and others at TCC. This is FC. This is a, a, a authorized PSI. This is only authorized versions. So the, the version that you've seen here from our uh, most efficient authorized PSI protocol works with RSA in ROM and in this presence of semi-honest adversaries. It has the online exponentiations, fairly expensive exponentiations in W multiplications for the server. For the client, it has V exponentiations. All the other protocols, if you look here, they have either, they, some have linear, like this one has linear, but look at, it's a, you know, Banan Waters, IB. Okay? This one is not, is quadratic. This one has quadratic on server, linear on client, okay? Uh, but it has malicious adversary protection. I'll come back to that then. Okay, our, our own APSI PPIT, as you saw, looks pretty good until you see this part, right? VW multiplication. So this protocol is clearly the most efficient, but you might say I'm comparing apples and, well, pears, because it does not give me malicious parties. The good news, is that 
our very recent work, in fact, in collaboration with Jihi uh, Kim here and uh, Emilia de Christopher, uh, shows how to uh, extend these protocols to protect against malicious players and still remain linear. And that's to appear at Asia Crypt in December. Just didn't have time to make up slides for it yet. Um, as far as private sub-intersection protocols, so this is the original polynomial, I believe it's polynomial evaluation by Friedman, Noah, and Pinkas. Yeah, standard model, semi-honest participants, quadratic. This is Yaretsky Liu, and I think this is Belenki and others. And I don't remember who, who are the others here, but these are, turns out they are quite similar in, 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 in terms of the techniques they, they show. So they have QDDH assumption and oblivious PLF. The standard model, except, except, except there's a CRS, the common reference string. And so, where I, from where I stand, if you have a common reference string, that gives me the right to use ROM with impunity. Because common reference string is a little bit exotic in some cases. Uh, this is work in progress by Yatsky Liu. The one I referred before is based on one more DH in ROM, semi-honest, fully linear uh, complexity. Our PSI that you saw, the first one, was based on also one more DH, ROM, semi-honest, cheaper, okay? Because this is, uh, um, no, sorry, this is, no, this is more expensive. It has W mult, so it has W multiplications more, and here it's the same. But remember, these two are not really comparable because of the security properties, right? So this one offers forward security and unlinkability. This one does not, and neither does this one. This is the one with pre-computation that you saw. One more I say, but uh, so I didn't have room here to add security properties or additional security properties. Now there may, I mean, this is an active area of research. There, there are papers. I think there's a talk this afternoon, right, about some uh, group set intersection. So uh, I think this clear that this is a fairly popular area of research, and I may have not covered some interesting recent results here. Um, so quickly, next topic, almost done. Um, I claim that uh, sometimes uh, size matters, not just in spam. Um, why does it matter? Well, uh, and size of what? Well, obviously I'm talking about set sizes here, right? So I mentioned, I think, a couple of times during the talk that uh, all the private set intersection, authorized private set intersection protocols leak one thing, S set size. Okay, and, and then about a year ago, we asked ourselves, is this, is this, a, is this a part and parcel of, of private set intersection? M must you always do that? Must you always leak that, that one parameter? That, and, and, and is it important not to, at, in, in some cases? And uh, we think it, it is important not to, and let's consider a couple of examples. Um, so we have a notorious terror watch list uh, run, you know, maintained by the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S. And it fluctuates in size, and its very size is considered secret. Now, DHS will not reveal the size of that list. There are rumors about it, like it's orders of magnitude of that, or this, or this, but nobody really knows. Nobody out, well, outside of WikiLeaks and DHS management. Another example is CIA. This is a real concrete example because CIA is by law prohibited from divulging the number of agents it has. Okay, so its budget is clearly black and you know, all, all hidden, but it does not divulge the number of agents. So if it were to run any set operation, like one of those that, you, that you've seen, where it wants to run uh, or compare a set of its agents against some other set, it would not reveal, the, or would not want to reveal the size. And then the sort of more mundane or more, more civilian example, so you have CDC, it's a center for disease control. Okay? Every country has some similar organization. They periodically deal with some massive or scary outbreaks of some bizarre, exotic diseases. Okay, like uh, even flu and uh, kind of cholera. So they need to somehow privately, well, in some privacy-preserving fashion, for example, query municipalities or government hospitals or school districts in order to find out how many patients on their lists have 
come from this area or that area, etc. So revealing the size of sick people, or the number of sick people, right? Leaks information and in fact can create panic. Right? So you tell people, oh, there's hundreds of children in your area are sick. So people will just panic, not send children to school, etc., etc. So there are clearly other examples. I just sort of figure enough, three is enough. So what is common about these examples? Or what, well, the size itself is private, right? The, the, the size, the number of elements in the list. Also, in some of the examples, not all, size fluctuations are private. So if you don't think size itself is, is in, like instant, instantaneous size, today is private, but maybe fluctuations in size are private. And also, so, so these are two privacy considerations, that the fluctuations and the size. And then performance. If you don't buy the privacy arguments, at least think about performance. So sometimes, one of the sets is so large that in fact transmitting it, even if you don't care about exposing the size, and transmitting it may be a burden. Because you pay per, per, per megabit or per bit or whatever. Okay? So let's, let's keep that in mind. So, does it make sense to ask this question about size in the setting of mutual private set intersection? I claim not. Because if you want to compute a private set intersection and you hide sizes of both sets, some little bird tells me you're not going to get there. But I'm not a theoretician, so I'll leave it to better minds or more curious minds. It seems to me that will be very difficult. But it does make sense for me to ask this question in the context of one-way set intersection. Where one party learns the intersection and the other one learns nothing. And in that case, it's clear what the question means. Can the client hide the size of its set from the server? That's the concrete question we're going to ask. Oh, where, yeah, where. And then is it easy? Is it easy to do? So is it trivial just take existing uh, private set intersection protocol and, and turn it into the size hiding private set intersection? Well, it doesn't seem to be so easy. Right? At least, uh, you know, you can stare at those protocols and I, you know, I invite you to do it if you have nothing better to do, uh, it's not so easy. And the PSIs that we've seen don't seem to achieve it. And naive approach is like, oh, you know, let's pad it. Right? Let's just pad. Well, padding is great, except that uh, it reveals the upper bound. And what if you have fluctuations? And eventually you cross that, pad, that boundary, right? You'd have to leak more information. Plus, you waste bandwidth and computation. Necessarily waste it, right? So that's not very elegant. So what I claim is we need a slightly, something different approach. Not slightly, really different approach. And, uh, well, here it is. Here's one. And this is a really, really simple protocol, actually. It is, I think it's easier to understand this protocol, or you understand, to kind of grasp what it does than all the others you've seen. Here's one simple thing. It's based on accumulators. Okay? So by the way, notice we still have the same notation, server, client, same hashes, all computation, mod n. Who is, who's n? Okay, first of all, who's n? There's no CA, so this is strictly a private set intersection. The n is server's n. Okay, so server here sets up an RSA setting ahead of time, publishes n, okay, and whatever. Doesn't need an e, there's no e, there's just an n. Remember this PCH? Same notation. Except this is multiplication, right? So PCH, product of client hashes. PCHI, product of client hashes, all but one. All but one. Accumulator. This is our accumulator. G in QRN. Generator of QRN. Raised to the power of the product. And then blinded with, with R sub C. Not strictly speaking necessary. There is a simpler example, but let's assume we need this blinding. This is constant. This message is constant size. So right away, we say, ah, this saves us bandwidth, especially when the client has a lot of things here. But of course, saving bandwidth comes at a price of um, computation. So you know what's coming. Let's look at the server. Server is really happy in this protocol. Because all it does, it receives this accumulator. Right? Computes Diffie-Hellman half-key. 
Not strictly speaking necessary either. We could get rid of it. But gives us better security. And then here's the, here's the important part. Right? Remember, all the particles have this K. It takes the accumulator, right? raises it to the power of this RS, which is its own you know, diffie hamlin contribution. And the most important part is here, inverse of HSJ. Takes an inverse of every element it has and raises it. You know, you know, that's, that's it. So what's the, what's the claim? The claim is if one of those P elements of HCI here is the same as HSJ, they cancel out. And what's left? Well, something like this will be left in the exponent. That's it. What does a client do? Well, a client gets this value right here. Now it gets W values, right? So, so the bandwidth is strictly determined by W. So if the server database is large, not so good. If the service database is small, excellent. Okay? But I claim no, no such instruction protocol can achieve smaller bandwidth than this, right? It's constant one way and linear the other, strictly linear the other. Uh, somebody wants to disprove it, great. Right? I think that's uh, so here is what happens on the on the client side and this gets a little bit ugly but only a little bit this K on the client side is recomputed like this you have Z to the RC Z here remember is is this this, this is the diffie Hellman half key the coming from the server and then raised to the PCHI now here comes a problem the RSA setting is on the server side okay only the server knows phi of n and can do nice things with it efficiently. What can the client do? Well, what is this PAC at PCHI? PCHI is actually a large, large integer. We cannot chop it down mod phi of n because we don't know it. Ouch. That hurts. So, you see every one of those exponentiations here? It's not one exponentiation. It's many. Okay? How many? Well, naively, it's going to be v square. V square. Well, at first we looked at it and said, ah, it's okay, we have v square, but at least we get this new extra property. Turns out we can cut it down to v log n. Why? Because all of these products, PCHIs, they're related. A lot of them share, you know, a lot, well, a lot of, a lot of common terms. So they can use it. There's a simple tree-based technique, and you can see it on the ePrint paper paper in submission, you can cut it down to v log n. That becomes much nicer. We're still not linear, but we get this nice extra feature of size hiding. Okay? And on the server side, we get fairly inexpensive computation. All of this can be done with, a, with the help of the CRT, et cetera, et cetera. So this is fully unlinkable, size hiding, private set intersection protocol. You can make it well, it's the same old claim, but I'm probably clearer in this protocol than the most others, because simply, well, it's, it's a simple protocol. So the security here is, again, semi-honest players. Semi-honest players, here's a challenge. If anybody is at all interested in this, try to prove security against malicious client. We have banged our heads against a brick wall here, trying to prove security against malicious client. It seems very difficult. Okay. S security against malicious server is probably doable. We just haven't looked at it, but I think it's relatively straightforward. The current security is currently against semi-honest players using RSA. Not even one more Q inverted, perverted, and bent over regular RSA. Not even strong RSA. So regular RSA in, in, in random Oracle model, you can see ePrint paper for details. There's actually a group extension of this which I don't have time to cover, uh, which works with, uh, which is a strange group extension. So if you're interested in group settings, so take a look. Um, so we don't know how to do with a malicious client. As far as cost, it has minimal bandwidth, linear for server, and V log V for the client. This is an optimization that trades off on linkability. So here, it's only client unlinkable, not server unlinkable, but it, uh, well, less costly. So you can see that the server here doesn't compute the Z, right? So what, what happens is that um, as far as this, you know, it's a server database, any fluctuations, oh, sorry, not database, any fluctuations in server set will be exposed to the client. 
but it is still client unlinkable, just quite a bit cheaper. Okay, uh, five minutes, right? Something like that? Yeah? So in the real world, of course, things are not done this way. In the real world, people want to have databases and ask queries, or post queries against those databases. Uh, I mean, there are settings where really you need to compare two sets, but at least we haven't been, haven't been approached by anybody from the real world saying, please do this for us. You know. But we have been approached, well, actually, funded by the intelligence agencies by, in the U.S. to do something similar in the setting of a database query, where the client is one, let's say, one intelligence agency, and it has a number of keywords or search items, relatively small, and it wants to in a privacy-preserving fashion, search using the search items against a server database. A server here is another intelligence agency. And you know, they are mutually suspicious. Right? So, it's a real-world setting, and it involves real databases. And the, 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 claim, uh, the, the requirement is to have sort of SQL, SQL-like interface. It takes an SQL query and then translates it into uh, something privacy-preserving with, you know, underneath, which looks like the protocols you've seen. And then you confront some real-world issues. Like, uh, what if you have multi-sets? Right? If you, you have multi-sets, then if the server sends a ciphertext to the client the, the, in tags, then these tags would be the same for the same element. You see, they say if, if Gene Suik appears twice in the database with different records, it will still have two, two tags that are the same that accompany those records. So what that means is that the patterns will be exposed. So it's not you know, immediately clear how to, how to do this. What about attributes? So if you can query a database record will have multiple attributes, and you can query the database by any of those attributes, right? uh, how do we encrypt based on the attribute? So we need some like attribute-like encryption. And then the, 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 ugly, the real ugly part in the real world is that in all the protocols you have seen, the server must transfer the entire encrypted database. This is fine if the database is just a set. Well, maybe fine. But if the database is a set of large records, for example, like a criminal's records, right? You have a name, you search by name, or social security numbers, those are small values, but the record contains a mugshot, a fingerprint, so it could be many, many megabytes long. And that means for every record, and there may be thousands and hundreds of thousands of records, how do you transfer the whole thing? Is it even viable? And then you have this other very subtle issue, which I found resonates with security people, but doesn't resonate as much with crypto people. And that's the liability issue. So if I give somebody an encrypted database of, of mine, so I'm a server, I give somebody an encrypted database, and I say, you know, they can only decrypt the records for which they have authorizations or for which they have matching, matching items. And the rest, I don't care about. It's all encrypted, right? Well, today it's encrypted with, I don't know, AES-256 uh, or something even stronger, which is fine. And certainly tomorrow we will not get decrypted. But I claim that there is this liability of possession, which means that 20, 30 years from now, the same AES will, will age, and it probably will not age gracefully. So that data that might be encrypted in that database, no, sorry, that, might, that is encrypted in the database, might be sensitive. And it might be sensitive 20 and 30 years later. So now I have the liability of possession. I, they can leak that information 20, or decrypt that information 20 and 30 years later because the encryption algorithm is, is uh, developed a lot of wrinkles. It's no longer as strong as it used to be. So there's an incentive not to transfer, the, in fact, the encrypted database if you're worried about long-term security. So which leads us to, some, to an architecture, and really I'm going to finish really quickly, uh, which introduces a, a third party. Now, not the kind of third party you're thinking of, no, or maybe, maybe not. Not a trusted third party, not a, not a big brother, not a CA, but an online third party which uh, acts as sort of a neutral uh, entity. We call it an isolated box. That's a terminology of our funding agency. Uh, isolated box. And so if you have the server, the client, the, the server will pre-encrypt the database. 
And essentially, you transfer it offline, and that's why you see the dashed line there. And, and I don't want to go into all the gory details, because I really don't have the time. Um, it will transfer the database ahead of time to the isolated box. And then in real time, the client and the server will run a protocol similar to what we've seen before, except that the data will already be residing on the isolated box. So remember, all the protocols we've seen essentially result in a transfer of tokens. And then the tokens are the ones that are matched by the client. And if they match, they, are, they come accompanied with data. Well, in this case, the data will not come this way. Well, the data will not come from the server to the client. Instead, only the tokens will. And then the client will query this isolated box based on the tokens. In other words, the client will only get the records, the encrypted records, that it can decrypt. OK? That's the main idea. That's the takeaway from this slide. The, the client, the, the, the database in its entirety, in the encrypted database, will remain here. And the amount of bandwidth going between isolated box and the client will be the same, but will be determined by the number of matching records only. So th then we solve this liability of possession, or at least we sweep it under a different rug. We say the isolated box is now charged with liability. And this isolated box, if it's really neutral, could serve more than one client. Right? More than one server. In fact, it could be the cloud provider, if you like the cloud, the, the cloud computing uh, analogy. Okay, so this is now there are a lot of more subtleties because this is talking largely to a crypto audience. I, I'm I'm, gonna, I'm skipping uh, the system, the interesting systems of security details, but there are a lot of them, a lot of interesting details that are, that uh, sort of escape. Uh, escape you when you design cryptographic protocols, but uh, really bite you in the, in the behind when you when you implement them. And this was, I said, it's part of the program that was funded by the intelligence agencies, uh, funding arm. And they, we were not the only ones. In fact, uh, there were five people, five entities. Uh, uh, the staff, which is uh, Rafi Ostrovsky, uh, has a technology, a set of technologies similar to this. University of Texas and Wisconsin, uh, Vitaly Shmarik of Samesh Jha also work in this, in this, in this, in this area, and that's Columbia. Uh, that's uh, Tal Malkin and Steve Bellavin and, and a few others. And then there's, of course, us, and then the MIT is more, the Lincoln Labs is more of an um, evaluator. So in conclusion, you've seen a menagerie of privacy-preserving applied crypto tools doing essentially some form of set intersection. We are look, always looking to how to extend things to work in a malicious model, relax some assumptions. Uh, we had some progress there. Like I said, uh, there's a paper here in Asia could, how to do this linear complexity private set intersection with malicious model. And um, we're also looking at uh, group settings. We have a couple of group protocols. They are just not uh, Worked, you know, the security proofs aren't worked out completely yet. So here's here's a couple of other th interesting things, and and there's some open problems here. Uh, how to do th related auxiliary uh, set protocols? Like you want to do a subset testing, right? So suppose you you wanted two sets, two parties, two sets. They want one party wants to test if its set is a is a proper subset of the other. Now, you might say, well, private set intersection already does this. Well, but it does this and more. You actually learn, right, information. Here you want to say, you know, client learns that its set is a proper subset of the server set. Otherwise, it learns nothing. Okay? Which is different. Or you want to do a set intersection and only learn the cardinality of intersection. Right, so cardinality. I, this is a social networking example. I stand next to somebody on the bus. I only want to talk to them if our Facebook uh, profile has at least five common friends. I want to know which their friends are, right? But five common friends, okay, I'll talk to you. Right, so ideally such protocols would be cheaper, right? They, they or, well, I, I hope they're cheaper. We have one example, one, one that is sort of works, but it's not cheaper. It's the, still the same complexity as a regular set intersection. And what about, like, testing intersection, like having a protocol that only returns one bit of information, that there is an intersection. Doesn't tell you how, how big it is, doesn't tell you what it is, but just tells you that there exists an intersection. 
again, and nothing else. So you, uh, that would be nice. And then, of course, there's a lot of work doing building r real systems. And uh, thank you for staying awake. <laughs>